Thank you. Thanks a lot, Neil. Thank you all for being here. It's such a pleasure to be at this meeting um, for the third time now. Actually, you know, and then if you count the Basel meetings, the fifth time. So it's, you know, the way this is growing, the, the numbers of people that are interested in this, I think is um, a sign of the way this field is, this field is growing and the way things are moving forward. So it's, it's really, really fun to be here. And you know, one of the things I love about it is we get to spend time with so many young people, really bright, motivated young people who are early in their, in their careers who are interested in this work. So um, I like what Bob Jesse said in the introductory remark, remarks about, you know, this is a, a, a relay race, a relay. So it, spending time with the people we're going to be handing the baton off to is, is really reassuring and, and gratifying. So it's, it's so good to all get together. And, you know, like yesterday, the presentations to hear the results as of these studies, this research that's being done in such a, you know, careful, um, meticulous way, and the results are continue to, to be extremely impressive. It's just um, uh, really feels good. And it makes me think about what I'm aware of all the time when we're, as we're doing our research, that if it weren't for these remarkable nonprofit organizations that are sponsoring this meeting and are, are supporting the research, it would not be happening. So there's a very real way in which this is a community effort. You know, this is, the government's not funding this. The pharmaceutical industry isn't funding this. This community is funding it. And if you think about what if this weren't happening? You know, here are these tools with so much promise for healing and growth. You know, we do have a long way to go to prove it to the standards of the FDA. So I, we're not getting ahead of ourselves, but you know, there's lots of reasons to think this, these are gonna be, or are very promise, very useful tools. And to think that um, if it weren't for these nonprofits, this community effort, and all the people that work so hard, and and the sponsors and supporters, it would not be happening. So, as Rick said, we are wanting to build bridges with the larger community. We're not wanting to be a counterculture. We're, we we are hoping that the government will get involved in funding research, and we're actively working on that. So, we want it to be a larger collaboration. But the fact is. If it weren't for this community and these organizations, we wouldn't be where we are. So we're, we're deeply, deeply grateful for that. Yeah, so I, I also want to say thank you for everybody that's here and all the people that have come up to me and thanked me for the work I do. And um, I just want to give back my thanks to you for being here and all the supporters and our teachers, our breathwork teachers, who we learned a lot of this from, um, our other teachers, and uh, MAPS um, for supporting us, uh, and also Sarah back at home, who is our uh, clini clinical research assistant, and we could not do this without her. Um, and also thank you to Michael and for all the years we've been, been able to work together and to be able to do this work um, for those people that are suffering, and then also to the subjects who have come forward um, and been part of our studies. Yeah, ditto, Annie. It's, it's such a gift that we can do this together. Um, so this morning, um, I'm gonna actually stand up and do the slides. So in the beginning, I'm gonna be doing most of the talking, um, going through the slides with you. I, I'm hoping Annie will stop and uh, get me back on course when I get off course and remind me of what I've forgotten, which is how I get through life from day to day. <laughs> I'm hoping she'll continue that now. And then um, after we've done the slides, Annie's going to read some quotes from participants in our current study, and then we want to leave time for questions and discussion afterwards, and we'll both be able to, to talk to you then. So. Um, the main thing we want to talk about is this study that's on the screen, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for uh, veterans, firefighters, and police officers with treatment-resistant PTSD, and uh, it's sponsored by MAPS. 
this is, these are the learning objectives for those of you that are getting CME. Uh, and th this is the outline of what I want to do. Just give a little background for, about MDMA for PTSD and summarize the results of the studies we've done, the study, study we've done. And you know, it's, in this group, it's hard to know how much to review and how much to give background uh, context for our current study. I know a lot of you have heard us talk about this before, so I apologize for repetition, but I also I figure if the meeting's twice as big, then half the people must not have heard it. So um, I'm going to try to summarize things and then uh, get down to talking about the three studies we're doing now, the one with veterans and firefighters and police officers the ma being the main thing, but we're also doing a relapse study uh, of people in the fir from our first study, and we're doing a training protocol in which we have permission to give MDMA to therapists who are going to work in research. So, and then Annie's going to read some quotes from the uh, participants. So um, just a little context, you know, there, there were many preclinical studies with uh, MDMA before we started doing, doing our research. One of the upsides of MDMA coming with a reputation is that many governments spent money on, on studying it, so MAPS and these other nonprofits didn't have to pay for all that. And then there were phase one trials. Charlie Grobe did the first one in the United States, and there were um, a couple others in the U.S. and in Europe. So that, that phase one is an FDA. These are FDA terms. That refers to people giving a substance to normal volunteers and measuring pharmacology and physiology. So that had all been done when we started in 2000 to work on our first protocol. And so what we're doing is uh, a or phase two trials, which means um, when you give a substance to people with a, a diagnosis and then you measure treatment effects. Um, I think anybody working with PTSD will agree that we need more and better treatments. Um, there are th these are the three uh, types of therapy recognized by the American Psychiatric Association in their monograph on PTSD treatment. There are lots of other interesting types of therapies that aren't so mainstream as well. Um, and then there's a lot of pharmacotherapy for PTSD. There are only two approved drugs, sertraline and paroxetine, uh, Zoloft and Paxil, but a lot of other drugs are used to, in an attempt to control the symptoms. And you know they're partially effective or partially helpful in some ways, but they're uh, and I don't think anybody thinks they are a really great treatment. And so um, it's a big problem. So if you look at, at trials of these existing therapies, at least 25 to 50 percent, I would say probably more than that, don't really respond adequately to existing treatment. So that's two to four million people a year in the U.S. alone to say nothing of all the countries where there's endemic conflict and even higher levels of PTSD. And of course, it's, the problem is growing here uh, with all the veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. And by the VA's own reckoning, there was a study at the bottom there that says less than 10% of people screened positive for PTSD get adequate treatment. That was a study in 2010 from the San Francisco VA. Um, so by their own accounting, they are not, uh, most people are not getting the treatment they need, not only because of the VA being overwhelmed, but also um, because uh, many veterans don't show up for treatment or, or aren't staying in treatment, the, of the kinds of treatments that are offered. So why, why did we think it would make sense to study MDMA for PTSD? Well, our thinking was, you know, for one thing, other people had used MDMA in psychotherapy uh, before it became scheduled in 1985. So, like, this wasn't a new idea to use it for as a catalyst to therapy. But um, for PTSD in particular, you know, it, uh, virtually all the existing therapies involve revisiting the trauma in the therapeutic setting and reprocessing it in some therapeutic way. And sometimes that works, you know, prolonged exposure and other treatments can work for some people. 
when they don't work, some of the reasons they don't work are either if someone tries to revisit the trauma, they get overwhelmed by emotion, uh, what Edna Foa calls over-engagement in prolonged exposure therapy, and they either they drop out of treatment, they can't do it, they won't do it, or if they do it, it's just kind of re-traumatizing and not helpful. So, and that's on one end of the spectrum, and people with PTSD have a lot of that, a lot of, um, you know, re-experiencing uh, being flooded by anxiety. On the other end of the spectrum, another reason for um, therapy not being successful is that people may with PTSD also have a lot of internal avoidance, emotional numbing. And so they may be able to kind of report on the, the trauma, but not be emotionally connected. And when that happens, the therapy doesn't work very well either. That's also documented in the prolonged exposure literature under engagement. So, and people with PTSD have a lot of trouble with trust. So it can be very hard to um, form a a good therapeutic alliance or have them stay in therapy. So it stands to reason if there's a, a drug like MDMA that can increase trust, decrease fear and defensiveness, um, maybe it could help overcome the obstacles to successful treatment. So that's why we thought that made, think that makes sense. Uh, kind of another aspect of the possible therapeutic effect is that um, people with PTSD don't often have a lot of positive experiences and they have kind of a negatively skewed view of the world and their safety in the world. So if MDMA can also give them some direct affirming experience, that can be corrective and helpful too. And this is just a diagram kind of depicting that idea. This is from Pat Ogden. So it's this is not a new idea, it comes from other kinds of therapy, but it, it sort of a, represents what I was talking about. If you picture a vertical axis, that's the level of arousal. So up on top is hyper arousal, where people are you know, flooded with emotion and they're kind of have um, disorganized processing. And then on the other end is when they're emotionally numb, hypo arousal, they're not engaged enough to have therapeutic change. So in the middle is this what's been referred to as optimal arousal zone or window of tolerance. Um, so maybe what MDMA, one thing that MDMA does is give people four or five hours in that optimal, optimal arousal zone so that they can you know, connect with the emotions but not be overwhelmed by them and then, then they can reprocess the trauma in some helpful way. I almost took these next two slides out um, because th this is kind of about what might be the um, neurological, neuropsychological correlates of what I'm talking about. And um, for one thing, I'm not a neuroscientist. I'm a clinical researcher, so I'm, I'm definitely not an expert in this area. And for another thing, the more evidence comes out and the more I talk to people who are experts in this, many of whom are here, the more I I'm aware of how oversimplified this model is and parts of it may be incorrect. But I think I'll just show you anyway that there, there probably, no doubt, there is some correlate, correlate to that optimal arousal thing that we can learn more about by brain imaging. You know, our studies are not designed to find out why this works. We're just trying to found, find out whether it works. But other people are working hard to find out more about why it works. We're trying to see if we can do some imaging studies too, but it's not our main focus. But the idea is that, um, you know, nobody has done neuroimaging with uh, people with PTSD before and after MDMA. We're exploring that. Ben Sess is gonna talk later about the attempts in England to do that. But what we do know separately is something about imaging with PTSD and imaging with MDMA and in normal volunteers. So. It's kind of interesting the way that may fit with what I'm talking about. Um, PTSD can be looked at as a deficit in fear, can, extinction of fear, and that's mediated by the um, amygdala and the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, again, in a, a simplified 
way of thinking of it. We know that people with PTSD in the hippocampus is also involved in this. We know people with PTSD have a uh, reduced hippocampal volume, and I, I think there's conflicting evidence about whether the activity is reduced or not, or maybe increased, but there's pretty good agreement that there's um, increased activity in the amygdala or the fear center. So um, that part of the brain is activated, but the frontal lobe processing is, is um, not really coming online the way it might. Um, and then we know in people with uh, taking MDMA in Franz Wollenleder's lab in Switzerland, Gamma et al. gave people um, MDMA and then did PET scans 75 minutes later. And among other things, they saw increased blood flow in the prefrontal cortex and decreased activity um, in the left amygdala. So that would kind of fit with the optimal arousal zone idea. So that's just kind of speculation. But um, what I'm really going to talk about is our evidence about how well it works. Oh, th the other thing about MDMA it, is it causes, releases a lot of hormones, including oxytocin and prolactin, probably being the most interesting in this respect. So that, that probably plays an important effect. Um, and there's wor a lot of work now with oxytocin. I think it's uh, Matt Baggett is has done that work. I'm not sure if he's here today, but he's going to be talking at the meeting and some other people are talking about it. And Torsten Passi has talked about the kind of post-orgasmic effect of prolactin and that may be, probably is part of the effect of MDMA. So it's very complex, but a lot of it kind of fits with what we see clinically. So um, this was our first study, uh, not the first phase two trial in the world because Jose Carlos Busso started one in Spain, but it got shut down very early um, before they got to full dose, but they, they did publish their, the results as far as they got. This is the first one to be completed. And um, after a, few, um, a number of years of going through the regulatory process, um, we got permission to start in um, 2004 in March 2000, February 2004, and we started the study in March 2004. So this was a um, trial of safety and effic efficacy of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy in people with treatment-resistant PTSD. In this case, mostly people with childhood sexual abuse or rape. And our, our hypothesis was, um, first, that we could safely administer MDMA to people with, with severe PTSD. Um, that's w perhaps the main purpose of a phase two trial is to, to test for safety in, in, the, in the patient population. And that the other part of the hypothesis is that it would Im improve PTSD symptoms as measured by standard symptom scales uh, three to five days after each of two MDMA sessions and at two months. It was double blind, placebo controlled. There were 20 treatment resistant people who had to have had psychotherapy and psychopharmacology with one of the approved drugs or a re related drug, an SSRI or SNRI. And we did have a couple of veterans at the end. Actually, one of those 20 was a veteran we got permission to study one additional veteran, but most people had, um, as I say, crime-related PTSD. Um, so 60% of the people received MDMA on two occasions initially, and 40% received placebo, inactive placebo in this case, on two occasions, um, along with all the psychotherapy that I'm gonna talk more about later when I talk about our current study. Um, the out, these were the outcome measures we used. The primary measure was the clinician administered PTSD scale. The IES was another PTSD related measure and then symptom checklist 90 and the NEO personality inventory. So in a nutshell, these were the results. Um, if you, the vertical axis is the mean CAP score and um, the, that 
heavy line in the middle is 50, which was our cutoff for enrollment, which signifies at least moderately severe PTSD. And then um, the time measurement points were baseline before treatment, uh, four days after the first MDMA or placebo session, four days after the second MDMA or placebo session, and two months after the uh, second session. And the placebo group is in blue, and the MDMA group is in orange. So you can see, actually, with the placebo group, we had a pretty good drop in caps, 20 points, a little over 20 points, but they still had, um, you know, quite severe PTSD symptoms. They were above 50. Um, that was actually statistically significant, even in the small number, that 20-point drop was a statistically significant improvement in the placebo or the therapy-only group. It wasn't really a placebo group in the sense of the usual drug trial because they got all the same all-day sessions with us, all the same preparatory and integrative therapy. So you can see there was a, a much greater response to MDMA-assisted therapy right from the first session. Um, and that spread was maintained throughout. So a little over 20-point drop with placebo, a little over 50-point drop with MDMA-assisted therapy, so a 33-point spread. And just to give you an idea, if you're not familiar with the CAPS, um, although you can't really compare the studies directly, but to give you a sense, in the sertraline, the um, ZOOF trials that led to approval as a with an indication for PTSD, the difference between sertraline and placebo was just under seven points. Here, here it's 33. Um, and then we had a crossover phase. The people who went through the placebo part, if they, uh, through the double blind part, if they got placebo, they could elect to go through the whole thing again, getting MDMA, open label. Um, so they kind of act, they acted as their own controls. And seven of the eight people that got placebo originally elected to do that. One person had a very good response to the therapy only, felt a lot better and decided she didn't need that. And you know, this was also with the same, all the same integration sessions afterwards, which I'll talk more about later. So here's what happened then. Um, the first uh, number, the first point, you know, again, the uh, mean cap score on the vertical axis, the, the first measurement was the original baseline of these seven people with the caps of 80. Uh, the second one was their baseline, of the, the baseline of those seven people r right before entering stage two. So after they'd had all the therapy with inactive placebo, that second point uh, was their baseline, just under 70. And then the next point, we didn't measure it as often in the crossover, but when we measured it two months after the second MDMA-assisted session, you can see it had dropped down to just above 30. So we again had more than a 30-point additional drop in the caps in this group. So they basically responded the same way once they got MDMA. Um, so that was a nice feature of the design because, um, you know, how do you know that the um, the um, placebo group wasn't like a harder group, a group that would respond less well? Well, in fact, it wasn't. They responded just as well once they got MDMA. And then because these are, are early studies, we tweaked the design a little bit as we went along. So some people got a third session. That's what that last point is. So there was some additional improvement with the third session, but most of it happened with the with two sessions. And these are just the two lines together. You know, the, the blue is the crossover, the orange is the original, getting MDMA originally. So they, you know, at two months they got to a very similar point just by different routes. And looking at clinical response, as opposed to um, drop and cap score, a common way to do that 
the way they did it in the, in the sertraline trials and the common ways that look at 30, at least a 30 percent reduction in caps. So in the placebo, only 25 percent had a clinical response in the MDMA assisted, it was 83 percent. And then when the people from the placebo crossed over and got MDMA, there was a 100 percent response in that, that small group. Because of the, uh, you know, concerns about could MDMA cause memory problems, based on the um, almost all retrospective studies and in recreational users, we we did neuropsychological measures. You know, one happy uh, fact about my presentation today is I'm not spending any other time on reviewing all the all the toxicity because although there's some open questions in recreational use or larger doses, we've really established that um, for this kind of use in controlled uh, situations of well-screened people with pure MDMA a few times, it's a, it's a favorable risk-benefit ratio, so we don't need to spend a lot of time reviewing all the toxicity stuff, but we did these measures just to um, get some more you know, prospective data about that, and here's what we found. Um, <coughs> the R bands, the repeatable battery for assessment of neuropsychological status, was our, you know, the most comprehensive of the uh, neuropsychological measures. But the other tests had similar results. So the R band scores on the vertical axis, higher is better. And so on the left is MDMA, green before MDMA gray after two MDMA sessions, on the right is placebo. You can see no, no indication of any neurotoxicity, um, slight trend toward improvement, but no statistical difference. Just a word about um, side effects. Um, I'm not listing them all here. On the um, left side are the commonly reported ones in the literature. And on the right are not all the side effects. You know, we tracked um, side effects, you know, after the session and for a week. So we've just pulled out here the um, severe ones, which is, the terminology is a little complicated. They're not serious, but on a rating of how, whether they interfered with your daily activities, um, severe means that you're unable to perform your daily activities. Um, so uh, you can see the list of what we found. Actually, there, in terms of severe anxiety, there was more in the placebo group than in the MDMA group. More fatigue with MDMA, more nausea with MDMA, um, more jaw grinding, as you might expect with MDMA, more, a little bit more insomnia, reduced appetite, and low mood. <coughs> Although the interesting about the low mood, there was more low mood that reached the level of severe, still only 2%, you know, following MDMA. But actually, the pe number of people that reported low mood, uh, not pulling out the severe ones, was actually higher in the placebo group the week after than it was in the MDMA group, which was kind of interesting. So this study obviously has limitations. We thought it was very encouraging. But it's a small sample size. Most people were female. They were all white. Um, the placebo group had a history of more psychotherapy than the MDMA group. But you know, happily, we kind of laid to rest the concerns that they were more treatment resistant by our crossover trial. <coughs> and then the, one of the big problems was the transparency of blinding, because we knew this was going to be a, a challenge, of course. Um, not too hard to tell whether somebody's taking MDMA usually. Um, and it's actually, if you talk to psychopharmacological researchers, to perhaps a lesser degree, it's a problem with, with most drug trials because people have side effects. Often it's not reported. It's, sometimes it is, but sometimes it's a don't ask, don't tell kind of um, approach to it. But we wanted to really track what was happening with this. So we had to record every time what, what we thought they got. We asked them, we recorded that. And we always guessed correctly. 
uh, not surprisingly, it's not didn't take an act of genius that we were able to tell. The participants usually guessed correctly, not always. One person thought she got MDMA when she didn't, and some people were not sure. But in general, yeah, we can't say we had a very effective blind. The independent raters, the psychologist doing the rating, was much more effectively blinded because the, he didn't have any contact with, he wasn't there for the therapy sessions, didn't see the tapes or anything like that. But still, that's a methodological challenge. Um, and the, there was the fact that additional psychotherapy sessions were conducted more often after MDMA. We don't think that was very significant, but that was another weakness. Because we do have the option to add, we, we put a lot of emphasis, as I'll talk about later, on integration and support afterwards. And we did have the option to add extra sessions if we thought somebody needed it. Um, and actually the fact that it happened more after MDMA sessions, you could say, well, maybe that, that's a, a side effect or a problem. Um, actually, we th another way to look at it is it's a sign of a more, much more active therapeutic process. You know, Stan Groff says a symptom is something that's halfway out. So we don't necessarily view a temporary increase in symptoms as a move in the wrong direction. Um, so that was our initial study with a two-month follow-up. Then we went back and, and added a, a long-term follow-up in which it was one year or more after the uh, completion of the study. Um, but it started after the last person had finished, so it was actually as you'll see, it ended up being an average of three and a half years later, but it was at least one year later, and we repeated the CAPS, the IES, and the NEO, and then we gave people our own questionnaire that we devised. And just to, so you understand the numbers, <coughs> this is kind of our flow diagram. We had, we screened over 100 people on the phone. We um, screened about 27 in person, and then, and randomized, enrolled 23 and randomized them, we had uh, two dropouts. So 21 completed. One of those was the veteran that hadn't had treatment, so we didn't count him in the analysis. I mean, we did report on him, and he did well too, but um, we stuck with our original protocol of treatment-resistant people. So we had 20 people. Um, of those, one person never got MDMA the person who had a response to placebo or to therapy only and then didn't go on. So we ended up with 19 people who had gotten MDMA and all 19 filled out the long-term follow-up questionnaire but only 16 completed the CAPS for one reason or another. Um, so here's what we found. Mean of 45 months after the last MDMA session you can see the left-hand bar is the original baseline for these 19 people. It was 80. The middle bar is the study exit for these, uh, the two-month follow-up, the exit from the original study for these 16 people. And the right-hand bar is the long-term follow-up. Mean caps for all 16 at three and a half years, it was no different from two months. Now, the two people did relapse to cap scores over 50. They're included in that that bar, so it didn't, the results weren't maintained for everyone, but it was also very encouraging um, that for, for most people, the benefits in PTSD symptoms were maintained. So it's, it, it kind of helps, doesn't solve the blinding problem, uh, you know, the concern about placebo effect, but it's certainly, it's not the typical placebo effect if it lasts three and a half years. Um, so, if you look at just the people who did the CAPS, that means we had 88% sustained benefit. But you have to say, well, how do we know the people that didn't do the CAPS didn't relapse also? Uh, we don't know that. We, we know that on their questionnaire, it didn't look like it. They reported um, the same degree of sustained benefit as everybody else, but that's not a validated measure. So, to be conservative, if you s assume, okay, they relapsed too, you still have 74% sustained benefit at 45 months. So that, that was the original study. Then um, a couple years ago, we got uh, FDA and DEA and IRB approval for a, a, just a small 
proof of concept relapse study uh, that allows us to give the people that relapse one more dose of MDMA along with a preparatory session and a, and a few follow-up sessions, a much more truncated thing. Um, and we, we actually have permission to do it for three people because we uh, identified someone else who relapsed later. But these two people who both did well during the first study and then relapsed around two and a half to three years later, some, I've forgotten the number, but for, they did well for several years and then they had a lot of stress in their life and they relapsed. So this is what happened. You can see the, the relapse baseline, the average caps was a little over 90, the mean, and then they both had a, a very big drop after one session. This was two months after that one kind of booster session, if you will. So, you know, only two people are not sure what to make of it, but it suggests that it's a, it can be helpful. Um, <coughs> the other st study, so that's one thing we're doing now. The other th another thing we're doing now is the, what we call the training study. So we have a, um, I'll, as I'll talk about later, we, we, another one of the weaknesses of the first study in reporting it is we couldn't um, independently verify that we were doing the therapy the same way with um, people whether they got MDMA or placebo. That was our intention. We thought we were, but uh, we had no way to prove that. So over that time, we worked on a treatment manual. At first, we thought that the idea of a treatment manual was kind of anathema to this approach, which is quite flexible and, and largely non-directive, but we, after we kept realizing, well, we got to have one anyway, we decided that we should be able to describe what we're doing and, and what's, what are the essentials of doing this. Um, so, uh, and I, I'm going to talk more about the approach later, but um, so we, based on the treatment manual, um, and we're, you know, we're, one important point is we're not saying we have discovered the way to do this. Uh, it's not that at all. It's we're saying we need a relatively standardized way to do it across studies if we're going to make progress with research. So we think we've arrived at a, a way, you know, based on what we've learned from many other people and kind of our own adaptation, we think we have a, re a, a way to do this an approach to the MDMA assisted therapy that at least we know it worked well in one study. So we're trying to, for research reasons, we're carrying that forward. So we now have a training program for therapists that are going to work in clinical research, um, you know, for these other trials that are going on that others have talked about and others will talk about more, trials in Israel, Colorado, Vancouver, um, and um, possibly other studies going forward. So. Um, we have a training program for five days in which we have a lot of video and discussion and things. So it's a non-drug program. It's not this training study. But for people who have done that, for instance, the, the team in Israel, um, if they want to, if there are people on those teams who have not had their own MDMA experience in the past, um, they can elect to do have one MDMA assisted session with us in the same setting as the, the therapy to give them an, at least some idea of what it's like. Um, you know, it's optional. It's not a requirement, of course, to take MDMA, but some people choose to do it um, in this setting. So, so far we've had three um, people come to, the, to do this, their own session, which is actually a phase one protocol. You know, the FDA requires us to have it be a research study, so we are measuring, doing some psychological measurements that haven't been done with MDMA in this therapeutic setting, but we, we limit enrollment to people who are uh, therapists who are working on research trials. Um, so, so far three people have, have done that. And uh, these are just two qu quotes from two of the people, just to give you some sense. This is one psychologist and one psychiatrist. and. One of them said, I feel better for the experience, both personally and professionally, better able to start conducting the study. 
it has opened up channels of introspection that I'm trying to keep open. And the other person, when she was talking about how it was to be back at work seeing her patients, said this, I might be more in a sense of listening and validating and less interpreting things with my patients. So these, you know, experienced clinicians both felt as well as did the third person felt that this was a, a useful thing for them both personally and in order to be able to do the therapy. Andrew Feldmar was saying yesterday, I think very correctly, that people need to have their own experience to do this, although, you know, we can't make that a requirement. We think it's highly desirable. Let me add something. The people come for five days, so they get the idea of what the preparatory session is like, and then the experimental session. We had to have a placebo session and one day of a placebo session and one day of an experimental session, and that's blinded, so they could come. I mean, it, you don't know how it's going to come. And then they have the, to spend the night, just like the study subject, and we have an integration section, session the next morning and then um, before they leave. So they get an idea of what a study subject is going through. So uh, this is the main thing we're, we're doing now in Charleston. This is our current uh, phase, again, a phase two trial, this time of MDMA-assisted therapy for veterans, firefighters, and police officers um, with chronic PTSD. And, you know, using the manualized approach, we now have people, independent raters, watching our videos and seeing if we're doing what we say we're doing. Okay, um, so it's, the protocol is 24 veterans, same cutoff for the caps of 50, but this time we're trying to address some of the limitations in the, in the previous protocol. One of them um, was that we had mostly women in the first one. So we're shooting for 50-50 now, but we may not get it. We, so far we have more men than women among veterans and firefighters, that's not surprising. So anyway, we're, we're gonna correct the imbalance of uh, male and female. But in, order, in, in attempting to address the blinding problem, instead of using inactive placebo versus MDMA, we're using low, medium, and full, what we call full-dose MDMA. So hoping that the low dose, at least, will act as an active placebo and that we can fool ourselves better is what we're trying to do. So um, and it, it, the doses are 30, 75, and 125, each one followed by an optional dose of half the original dose one and a half to two hours later. Uh, and this time we're not doing the outcome measures four days later, we're doing them one month after the second session. So people get randomized to two sessions, blinded, of low, medium, or full dose. A month later, the psychologist repeats the outcome measures and we break the blind. And then if they got full dose twice, they get one more full dose session open label. If they got low or medium dose twice, then they get three full dose sessions, open label, and follow up measures of two months and one year. So um, I just think most of you know this, we don't, this is not like take home MDMA for PTSD. They get the MDMA with us in, under our direct supervision. Annie and I spend the day with them for at least eight hours. Um, and then they stay overnight, as Annie was saying, um, with the attendant on duty. We meet with them the next morning before they leave. We speak to them on the phone every day for a week, and then we meet with them twice more in between until the next session three to five weeks later. And there are a lot of, um, I, I forgot to change those numbers, but there, there are a lot of, so the number of, uh, non-drug therapy sessions is actually not correct, but um, there are a lot of, there's a lot of attention to integration and support afterwards, which we think is a very important part of it, and attention to preparation for the getting to know people, getting to for, form an alliance, and preparing them for the effects of MDMA and also for the approach to the, the sessions. And 
like the first study, these people have been carefully screened medically with physical exams, EKG, lab work, and psychological screening. This is where we do the sessions in our office. It's a nice, private, comfortable place. You know, I meant to mention with that first slide, although I am on the clinical faculty at the medical school in Charleston, this research is not happening there. In the beginning, they were very insistent that I make that clear at all times. <laughs> uh, now I think uh, there's less concern about it, but um, it's actually a good thing. We get to do it in our office, um, and uh, it's a nice place to do it. I sit in that blue chair on the left, and he sits on the other side with the music and the blood pressure machine. You can see we have eye shades and headphones for people to use when they're focusing inward if they're comfortable with that. Some people with PTSD are not comfortable having eye shades or covering their ears or even closing their eyes. So we never push that, but we invite people to do that to help them focus inward. We have had approval for this study to cover up the blood pressure machine too. We take two measures before we give the capsule and then we cover it up unless somebody is, has hypertension and then we're allowed to have people with controlled hypertension um, who are being treated, and then we, we will look at the blood pressure for those people. Yeah. Um, so the, the method of therapy, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. We did that in our workshop, but just to say that, you know, this wasn't our original idea. We've learned so much from others, inclu including our, we both trained with Stan and Christina Groff in the whole trophic breath work. Um, which is really based on LSD psychotherapy. Our, our primary reference to the FDA for our method of therapy for the first study was Stan Groff's LSD psychotherapy. Um, and others, you know, George and Rick Wittel, George Greer and Rick Wittalbert, I think George is here and gonna be talking. Um, you know, they published their experience before it was illegal and Ralph Metzner and Leo Zeff, we, we didn't know Leo Zeff, but we had teachers that had learned from him. So it's, um, we've taken so much that we've learned from others and kind of tried to adapt it uh, in a, a helpful way to this um, research. It's a, it's a largely non-directive approach, although sometimes we're quite active. Um, the idea is to support and follow someone's emerging experience and um, to have alternating periods of inner focus with talking to us. There's no schedule for that. Um, we just think both are important and we encourage people to do a fair amount of each. And as I said, we now have a, a treatment manual so everything is videotaped, all our sessions, both the drug and the non-drug sessions and independent raters can see if we're, we're doing it the way we say and, and can see if, it's, if the other study teams are doing the same thing so we'll be able to compare results, compare results with the studies in Israel and Canada and Boulder. And, and uh, Peter and Verena, uh, who are going to talk about their study later, did it much the same way in Switzerland, although we didn't have a manual, so we couldn't really prove how we were doing it. This is just a, a point I want to make. Three people in the first study said, I don't know why they call this ecstasy. Um, so it, it's not that people just um, have a day of being blissed out and everything's fine and the PTSD is gone. It, virtually, usually, people have some periods of very affirming, even joyful or ecstatic experiences, feeling comfortable in their body for the first time in years, but usually more of it is hard, painful, therapeutic work in which they're revisiting their trauma and really feeling and we're encouraging them to stay with these painful feelings so that they can work with them and move through them, to full, you know, feel them, express them, move through, so that they can move through them by being willing to be with them is what we encourage people to do. Uh, again, the screening and outcome measures are, this time we have two psychologists uh, not involved in the treatment who do our measures, they're both um, on the faculty at the medical school. And this, the other thing we've done in this study is, you know, it was clear, which I'm sure won't be a surprise to you, that 
people were talking about a lot of benefits that weren't captured on the CAPS, on the ratings of the PTSD symptoms. So um, we're trying to do a little better at capturing some more of what's going on. So we've added these other measures. We still use the CAPS as our primary outcome, but we've added the Beck Depression Inventory, the Global Assessment of Function, the Post-Traumatic Growth Inventory, the Pittsburgh Sweet Quality Index, the States of Consciousness Questionnaire, and we still do the NEO Personality Inventory. Um, so far, we've enrolled uh, 13 people, 11 vet veterans and two firefighters. Uh, nine have completed all their sessions, two are in progress, and we have a few more in the enrollment process. Uh, we've had two dropouts the, who dropped out of treatment, but were willing to come back for follow-up. One was a veteran who got one medium dose session and um, had very good results and didn't feel he needed any more. Um, and the other person was someone who got, had a low dose session and it was so hard for him to, to stay there for eight hours with the low dose, which may have made him a little more activated and anxious. And we had, based on our experience so far, um, again, the numbers are small, but um, everybody who's gotten low dose has found it difficult to one degree or another. So we've actually, originally people got three lower or medium dose sessions. Now we change the protocol to be two because we don't feel we can ask somebody, you know, they've tapered off all their other medicines. We don't want to ask them to go that long stretch of three months without um, being able to get another treatment. <coughs> so um, we've had seven men and one woman with combat trauma, three women with military sexual trauma, and two male firefighters. We've had Three, 398 was a few, 10 days ago. We've now had more than 400 veterans call us from around the country without our, having, our recruiting. They've read about the study. The need is so great. It's, it's heartbreaking that they're calling us. You know, every week we get many calls and we, we can't accommodate them. But we are still enrolling people. I wanted to add something about the, um, I don't know why that we, you call this ecstasy, or they call this ecstasy. Um, people have said that the work after the session is really hard. One uh, man said it was like being a baby or a toddler and learning to walk again. So, so these are these are just preliminary results. Uh, we don't, you know, I don't want to make too much of it, but we want to give you a flavor of what we're seeing so far. Um, so far, this is f we've excluded the dropouts from this. So we have four people with who've gotten full dose, three with medium dose, and two with low dose. So you can see that the low dose is actually having a response a lot like the um, inactive placebo, although people are reporting that it's harder for them than the inactive placebo people did. But they have um, about a, a little over 20 point drop in caps, which was the same is an active placebo. And then the, um, you can see with these numbers, the, low, the medium dose has actually had a, uh, the mean had a, a bigger decline than the um, full dose. But you know, I'm, I'm not sure that'll hold true, but uh, my guess is that they may be equally effective. Um, so it's about a 40 point drop with full dose and about a, um, 60 point drop with medium dose. So, you know, that's kind of in the range of the little over 50 that we had had in the other study. So, who knows where this is going to go, but that gives you a feel for it. And just since it's a small number, there's no point in analyzing it, but I thought I'd show you just how it looks individually. So, here I'll show you the full dose first. There's one person who uh, did, she ended up with about a 15 point drop in caps but still had, you know, high symptoms. You'll notice that, um, actually going back to the other one, you'll notice that the mean caps in this group is higher, uh, you know, in all the groups is around 10 points higher than it was in the first study. Um, so that's a full do one full dose person. That's probably why the full dose in the small number is not as good as the medium dose. Um, that person had a, a modest response. 
this person had a um, a strong response with um, three sessions. This person had a strong response with two sessions, and this person had who started lower didn't have too much response with two, but had a um, a good response with three. And here's a medium dose person with a good response, another one with a good response, only two sessions because we changed the protocol, another one with a good response to two, and that's, that's all of them. So just to give you a sense of that, and then I'm going to give you a sense of the other, oh, I'm getting confused. Okay. You're supposed to keep me on track, babe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not easy to do sometimes. Okay, there's a low dose person who had no response to two, but then had a response with three, uh, another low dose, and another low dose who had no response to two. So gives you a sense of it. Um, here's the Beck depression inventory. The full dose group had much higher depression. That <clears throat> you can see on the lower left, more than 29 is severe depression, 20 to 28 is moderate, and 14 to 19 is mild depression. So um, no change in the people who had um, moderately severe depression with the low dose. Um, big change in, in the per people who had severe depression with full dose and uh, good change in the people who had moderately severe depression with medium dose. Here's the global assessment of functioning. Um, you can see improvement with the full and medium dose, no improvement with the low dose. Here's the post-traumatic growth inventory, the idea that people, if they grapple with trauma, um, that not only can their PTSD symptoms get better, but they can have growth from it. So again, you can see no improvement with the low dose, quite a bit of improvement with the medium and full dose. This is a P Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. People with PTSD usually have terrible sleep, and that w these people were no exception. Again, you can see um, no change in the low dose, quite a lot of improvement in the medium and full dose. Still not ideal, F five, less than five is, um, lower score is better with this. So less than five is good sleep quality. So they still had some sleep problems, but much better than it had been. Um, and then the states of consciousness questionnaire, um, you, you know, in, in conversation with um, Roland Griffiths and Bill Richards of the Hopkins group, uh, you know, they had found that uh, with psilocybin, the level of mystical experience correlated with the outcome. And so they encouraged us to include the, this measure um, that was developed by Walter Pankey and Bill Richards. And I'm going to skip that one. Briefly, here's what we saw. Um, if you saw the talk yesterday about, day about the Hopkins psilocybin smoking study, you'll see that these scores are not uh, as nearly as high as with psilocybin, which we are not surprised by. But it's also pretty interesting that on these different realms of mystical experience, the low and medium dose were considerably higher than the low dose. So, so Annie's going to read some quotes now. And then we'll have time for some questions. So this is a 26-year-old Army veteran, one tour in Iraq. It's like PTSD changed my brain and MDMA turn, changed it back. This is a 12-month follow-up with a 27-year-old Marine. He had two tours in Iraq, and he was a gun turret. Turret gunner, sorry. Being in Iraq was bad, but for me what was worse was having my body back here and part of my mind still in Iraq. Being in the study allowed me to bring the rest of myself home. I know there are a lot of vets who still haven't been able to fully come home. This is a 30-year-old female Army veteran with PTSD from military sexual trauma. It's helped me in so many ways. 
It feels like it's gradually rewiring my brain. It feels like the MDMA sessions were just the crack in the, were the crack in the ice because the trauma was so solid before that. It took a long time to integrate and it was confusing, but gradually I found that I could get back to that kind of state on my own. It was incredibly intense around the MDMA sessions. It was a lot like a big bubble from the unconscious that popped. It brought up a lot and it took time to slow down. This is a 28-year-old Marine with two tours in Iraq. I've been experiencing a lot of feelings since yesterday that I haven't felt for a long time. Feels like a good thing, like a loosening of stagnation, of frustration and rage that I've been suppressing. This is 12 days after a uh, second MDMA session. It feels almost like the inner healer or the MDMA is like a maid doing spring cleaning. It's as if you thought you were cleaning before, but when you got to things you didn't really want to deal with, you'd just stick them in the attic. If you're going to clean the house, you can't skip the attic. I keep getting the message from the medicine, trust me. When I try to think, it doesn't work out. When I'm, but when I just let the waves of fear and anxiety come up, it feels like the medicine is going in and getting them, bringing them up, and then they dissipate. The medicine just brought me a folder. I'm sitting at this big desk in a comfortable chair, and the medicine goes and then rematerialize, rematerializes in physical form, bringing, bringing me the next thing. This is a folder with my service record. It says I need to review it and talk to you about it from the beginning so it can be properly filed. This is the day after an MDMA session. MDMA is like being the boss of a company and taking a tour of the grounds. Since you don't usually work there, it's confusing. But then you see it's all going well. Everyone's doing their job so you can go back to being yourself and trust that it's being taken care of, like a program running in the background. That last session, if nothing else comes of all this, besides the rage not taking over, that's big. The first times were like opening a door, making you aware that there even were doors to open. The higher dose was about knowing you could make the choice to go through the door and experience the feelings. It helped me remember stuff that I don't know if I ever would have remembered. I can see a light at the end of the tunnel. It's still far away, but there's almost hope. And two more. In a way, I felt connection to the divine. From that point on in the first session, I wasn't afraid anymore. I felt like life went on and on and on. I got the feeling I really belong, and I developed an appreciation for all of me, for all of the parts of me. I decided in the first session, everybody gets to stay. I'm an all-welcome neighborhood, and the thing I like best about this, it's the best adventure ever, my goodness, in here is a vast universe. And the last one, uh, he had an image of a sluice box with water coming out. And he said, I don't need to have diverter gates. I just need to let it flow out of me. I've had all this baggage, and you can't make the journey with all this baggage. Now I'm throwing out the stuff I don't need to move forward. What I need is love compassion and concern. What I don't need is needing to be in control. Thanks. I think we have a little time. Or comments? <laughs> Hi, you folks. Are, you folks are beautiful. 
Thank you. Thank and, you. And everybody behind you supporting you, so thank you, first of all. <laughs> Thanks. Thank I, I'd like our, your opinions on the use of MDMA with cancer, specifically late stage cancer, people with cancer that have PTSD. I think it's a wonderful idea. Um, MAPS actually had a protocol at Harvard for MDMA assisted therapy for um, advanced, you know, people with life threatening advanced stage cancer. Um, unfortunately, they had a real trouble with recruitment. And then John Halpern, the investigator, went on to other things and it, it didn't happen. Um, we would love to do such a study. I think it's really important. Would your protocol be much different than what you've been sharing? I think it would probably be very similar. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. With 400 veterans asking for participation in the study, uh, it sounds like you've got a group of people that could provide a, a fairly strong advocacy group to the federal government or the state governments if necessary to promote this kind of research, or at least when the time comes for FDA approval, be in support of it. Are you or is MAPS looking at any sort of an uh, utilizing some of this interest to develop an advocacy group that we could use in the future? Well, not formally. We are, I mean, I think that's a really good point. And one thing that struck us about the veterans especially is they, they have a lot of concern for the other veterans, of course. Um, you know, one Marine said, we were trained, we never leave anybody on the battlefield behind and there are people behind that we need to help. So the, the veterans are quite, some of them are quite vocal about wanting to do such a thing. We have, uh, Rick showed a slide at the Pentagon, we have been in meetings there and also uh, in a lot of dialogue with people in the VA. So we're, we're making a concerted effort to, to convey that to them and I think we're making real progress. Um, and some veterans have spoken up, have written letters um, to the VA and the officials. So that's happening to some degree, but it would be good to talk more later maybe about your ideas about how to, how to do that even more. Thank I'd you. I'd like to add something though too. Um, as the veterans go back to their therapists, they talk and we had one veteran go back for um, an appointment when he, after he was finished with our study and his uh, doctor told him that he was cured and he didn't have to come back and he was just like shocked so you know as we have results that's going to help that was his doctor at the VA yeah his doctor at the VA mm -hmm. uh, hi um, so Michael and Annie thank you so much for all your years of fine-tuning the way to deliver MDMA therapy for PTSD and developing uh, the manualized approach um, as you know my interest is in how much flexibility there is in the approach and you know um, but what about something even quite major like just one therapist delivering a session could you imagine um, a, an approach using just one therapist the reason I'm thinking this is you know we we look at the massive clinical burden of PTSD and the massive need to get these treatments out there and get people delivering them so that's one of the things that we're exploring the possibility of using just one therapist. Can you, can you imagine that? Yeah, I, I really can imagine. I mean, I think that's a good point. You know, we, we, having trained with Stan Groff, we were, you know, trained about this model of male and female co therapists which I think is really good, but certainly not the only way. Uh, there's absolutely no reason why this couldn't be done by one therapist. Um, you know, our, our th approach now is in this phase two, we're not really set out, we're not setting out to determine what are the, how it can be pared down, how it can be fine tuned. We're trying to say, based on what we know, how can we optimize the chance of showing it that it's effective with the FDA? So that's our mission. But I think there's plenty of room and it's going to be important to going forward to sort that out. You know, how well does one therapist work? Should it be, is that good for some kinds of people and not others and all that? Yeah, I think that's definitely group therapy. Can that be done? I think all of that will come. We're just not at that point with the research yet, but um, let's have that ongoing discussion. Thank Maybe you. with the military sexual trauma, it's probably useful to have 
the male and female. Yeah. Uh, two things, actually. First of all, um, I think it's amazing that you're doing this, and I sincerely hope that soon it can be made available to more people because I actually know of so many veterans coming home and, and seeking this sort of healing on their own in a more recreational setting. And as you, of course, know, it's so important, the set and setting to um, really make the healing happen. But I know some are seeking and actually accomplishing some small amount of healing in a recreational setting. Um, and I have one question about... Um, uh, yeah, I know that you're only able to do this currently in treatment resistant patients and I'm just curious how long is it actually taking in standard mainstream treatment and is this ultimately going to be the best form of treatment um, compared to what's now the mainstream that in patients where it is working how long is it taking um, the standard treatment well um, th that's a good question there, there's some data that it, five years later with treatment, 50% of people still have severe PTSD. Then if you look at some of the uh, exposure data, they show good results in 12, uh, with 12 sessions. So I think that's not the usual thing in clinical practice. So yeah, I, I think, I don't know the answer to that. You know, we're doing treatment resistant PTSD because it makes the most sense in terms of the FDA being comfortable. But we don't think that it necessarily should stay that way if it does get approved. And then you have the other question about whether it's complex PTSD and how many traumas people have had. No, no, no. And I was just asking for the, for the small number of people where standard therapy does seem to be working. How okay. long does it take in comparison to the MDMA-assisted therapy? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. In, the, in those two patients that relapsed in the long-term study, were there any clinical indicators looking back that would have maybe predicted that group? Uh, yes, they had stress in their lives. They um, had financial difficulties, um, loss of work. So all of that can really complicate how well people do. I think those were, wouldn't you say that with those two people, Michael? Yeah, and you know, it, it's as encouraging as our results are, we don't want to portray that this solves everybody's problem because if you've been living with uh, PTSD for years and in the first study it was 19 and a half years on average, people tend to have a lot of relationship, financial, psychosocial problems that can still be an ongoing challenge for sure, but it seems to often help a lot with those, but they may still be there. I'm interested if there's any specific strategies you bring in the integration session at the end. Um, well, yeah, we, we describe it in the manual, um, but they're not so specific, they're more general, in, in which we encourage people to um, talk about the experience we, they have, we let them know that they may have uh, challenges in integration, that it's expected that they may have waves of emotion, that waves of processing that may be easy or they may be quite difficult and that doesn't mean something is going wrong. So a lot of it is encouraging them to call us if they're having trouble, to let them know to expect that, um, that this may happen, that it may be difficult at times. So kind of that's a lot of the emphasis. And then, you know, as long as we stick with them, we can help them move through that successfully. And then we do have tools. We sometimes work with parts that have come up in the therapy and, and maybe the critical parts that are there. Um, we sometimes do mat work, uh, which we've learned in uh, holotropic breath work. So sometimes if there's a lot of energy or anger coming up, we work on a mat if they're comfortable. Um, some people are not comfortable with that. And we work with having them practice being in their body in the present moment and feeling that and trusting that they can actually feel that and get through that because hopefully they've had that template from the MDMA session that this is a work in progress and they need to keep working at that at home. Um, each day they need to keep working on that, that they need to start bringing feelings back into their life because so often they don't have joy or happiness because they're not feeling, you want them to start feeling feelings again. 
uh, what I, you know, I didn't go into detail about the manual, obviously, but part of it is a lot of flexibility for the therapists to use their own training, background, intuition, inclination about how to address these challenges that come from it. We don't try to standardize that too much because there's going to be a lot of variation among therapists as long as they're sticking with the overall approach. And I'm also thinking about art and how art plays a part for some people and also music. Uh, some, you know, if that is something that they've done before and they've left it behind, to try to bring those things in that nourish and um, bring them happiness and life. Hi. Uh, you mentioned uh, in your phase two clinical trials that you added a couple of outcome measures. And I was wondering um, uh, if you can predict, I guess, um, what you would see if you use the uh, positive and negative symptoms scale. And I know that that's more for um, schizophrenia and individuals who are prodromal for psychosis and, and things like that. But would you, would you expect that there would be a clinical application for MDMA with individuals who, who specifically, I guess, for their negative symptoms, individuals with schizophrenia? I, I think that's a really interesting question and should be researched at some point. For right now, we need to focus on like one or two indications to bring it through the regulatory process. And then at that point, it'll be much easier then to expand the research into these other very interesting areas like that. I noticed that there was no mention of uh, traumatic brain injury in the screening. Um, and I wondered if that was a conscious decision on your part. And I also, a second part of that question is how you might feel this would complicate treatment with the uh, MDMA um, therapy. Thank you. Yeah, that's been something we've spent a lot of time talking about. Um, you know, there's not a really gold standard test for traumatic brain injury. So we're not. We, we have no way to absolutely exclude it, but what we do is try to take a practical point of view. If people have significant persistent symptoms from traumatic brain injury, then we don't take them. It would be great to research how it might help them, I don't know, but we just didn't think that was appropriate at this early stage. So we, we exclude people with obvious traumatic brain injury. We do, you know, most, peop most of the veterans have been exposed to blast injury sometimes a number of times. So we know that some people in our study have had some degree of traumatic brain injury, but they have to have, you know, those symptoms largely resolved. Of course, that's very hard to determine because there's a lot of overlap, as I'm sure you know, between PTSD and traumatic brain injury. So we do the best we can to keep it within a normal, I mean, a reasonable, uh, degree of certainty that they don't have significant traumatic on, you know, lasting traumatic brain injury, but it's, it's not easy. Hi, thanks again for all, everything that you're doing. I'm wondering if you could sort of give us an idea <coughs> of what the trajectory of the research looks like. You know, you're having these amazing results, but it's still, you know, FDA, you got to get more and more and more approval. So what does the trajectory of that look like? How many more do you th studies do you think you're going to have to do before there's more of a result? Or, or what kind of studies are you going to have to do? Um, well, Amy Emerson did a great job of presenting that earlier this morning. Oh, and this and she said, said she was going to have a chart of that oh. um, someplace. Are you here, Amy? I guess she's not here. Okay. Um, so m maybe we could talk later because it's kind of a long answer, okay. and um, okay. but we can direct you to that that chart and talk more about okay. it later if that's okay. okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. The other piece is one of the things that I'm noticing in my own practice is that people who have gone through this latest economic downturn and have lost their houses and lost their jobs, there's a whole huge population in this culture that's walking around with PTSD and nobody is acknowledging it at all. So there's a great population for you. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Dr. Beth Klein. I'm a psychiatrist. Uh, I served a tour in Iraq from 2004 to 2005. Um, and my life has been a disaster pretty much since then. But what I really wanted to ask you about was you were talking about memory. Because one of the things that's, that's happened to me is I have been in, not been able to work through a lot of the, the things that the VA has is because I don't remember. I don't know what happened. 
You know, people are like, well, you did this, you did that, but I don't have recall of uh, a lot of incidents that happened. And you were saying something about uh, that some people on MDMA are having some memories return. Do you know that they're valid? Are they screen memories? What's, what's going on? I mean, I'd like to know what happened. <laughs> so we, we believe some people are having um, ac accurate memories. Kay. We haven't had anybody like remember an event that they hadn't remembered. Right. We've had people, an example would be one of the firefighters who was in a, right. a fire a disaster where it went right. on all night and a lot of firefighters died. And he realized during the session, he said, I thought I remembered it all, but then I realized the that I had back. compressed it. And I there was see. like, from this point I remember to that point, actually there was like four or five hours in between that right. he remembered clearly in detail during the MDMA session, but hadn't with the before that and that was actually with a low dose session hmm. we were fooled we thought he'd gotten at least medium dose but he got, he got low dose and had all those clear memories come back which uh, I believe were accurate now um, a lot of people who are treated for uh, PTSD are treated with SSRIs so what's the length of time they need to be off the SSRI for the MDMA to actually do anything <laughs> Um, well, the requirement in the protocol is five half-lives, so okay. it depends on the drug, like Prozac, right, 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 right. six weeks, as you know. Um, but we try to have people off for at least a couple weeks longer than that, um, so that they can, you know, at least some uh, return of receptor down-regulating and what, mm -hmm. whatever else is going on. So it's good to have longer than five half-lives if you can, we think. Okay. All right. I hope we can talk later. Okay, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. You had talked about um, the earphones and um, that there's music to listen to. And I was curious how you constructed the soundtrack of the music. And um, when you're bringing them out to talk to you, what happens to the music and uh, the use of the earphones, headphones? And he's the DJ. Well, <laughs> My um, music comes from my breathwork training, and uh, you know, in the first study that we did, I I used more or less a playlist that I would go back and forth on. Um, so I I do have a huge collection of music, and in this study, I don't use the playlist as much. I I have specific things that I know where they could go at different times, but I um, add things to that and. Um, and we were saying in the workshop that with the younger people, um, they don't really, I mean, it's not that they don't like my music from the breath work, but maybe it's just aged, you know? And maybe, um, so I, that's where I think the younger people that are interested in this um, can bring their, their own music. And we've let some of the veterans bring their own music and added that. And when they're talking, we turn it off or we turn it down. Um, some people don't want music at all. And so, you know, we don't insist. We um, ask people to try it and see how they do. Hi, thank you. Uh, a, a, <coughs> a woman previously made a comment that triggered a question for me. She was talking about all the vets coming home who are using MDMA recreationally to get some of these results, if I heard her correctly. and. Um, First, a comment, then a question. One is we should probably call that something other than recreational use, whether it's non-professional or unstructured or whatever. Um, and the other thing is, uh, I mean, I know this isn't for you to do because you have to maintain your scientific, political credibility, but I wonder if anybody's working on it or maybe in all the psychedelic literature that comes out all the time, it's already exists somewhere but some sort of uh, a manual or an outline of how a, a person who is struggling with these issues and can get their hands on some quality MDMA can with themselves or with, with a friend who's sensitive enough. I mean, I, I mean, this is a long way from what you're doing, but <clears throat> if that's the only game in town for some people, I, I wonder what, what kind of um, uh, guidelines there are for somebody to do it in that way. Thank you. Uh, you know, I think it would be foolish to think that nobody gets help from it using it outside of research, but we can't go there. 
<laughs> you know, we, we've really got to focus on, on this legal research and our manuals for intended for use in research. But I see what you're saying, but uh, somebody else is going to have to pursue that avenue. Thank you for being here. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that you're a stunning example of what a very few group of people can do um, to change the world step by step. And so I think we're all grateful for that. My question is, um, can you comment briefly on the process and effects of holotrophic breath work? Well, um, uh, you know, I think it would be too long an answer to comment on the effects, but what we can say is that when we did holotropic breath work for 10 years, groups every month, and worked with individuals in between, we found it very, very helpful for many things, including PTSD for a lot of people. And we also think that it's one of the most important parts of our own preparation for doing this work was the holotropic breath work training. So I, I've had a lot of questions from young people in graduate school and wanting to do this about how, what's a good way to prepare. And I always say going to the holotropic breath work training is one of the best ways I can think of. As a precursor to the, um, what you're doing. Right, to do your own work and to have a lot of experience sitting and facilitating for other people. It's really, really a great way to learn, it was Thank for you. us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. One more Hello. question, please, and then um, you can, the other people can come up afterwards if you'd like to ask us. Hello. Um, I imagine that uh, it could be sometimes difficult work with a protocol uh, because sometimes some patients need some things, some kind of interventions. And other patients need other kind of interventions. So uh, I imagine sometimes you would like to do uh, different things than what you can do because of the protocol and these scientific rules. So I would like to know um, if you uh, uh, if you could work with this substance without a protocol, uh, without these scientific rules. Uh, what would you, would you like to do different? Yeah, yeah, that's one of the, I mean, you put your finger on one of the real challenges of doing research. Um, you know, we don't have that liberty, but I think um, if, if we did or if when, when we do and it gets approved, I think, you know, to have flexibility about dose for individuals, flexibility about number of sessions and timing of sessions, uh, that'll be very nice when we get to that point. And I think that there are a lot of common things that we do uh, despite the protocol. We support everyone through the process and we tell them that we're going to be there for them and follow them through the process. And if the protocol is over and the t therapy's over, we're still going to be there. We're going to talk to people on the phone or email. And I it's part of, I think, what we've learned in breath work that it is part of a family and the container is a very large family and you are, are not going to, I mean, it's not going to be an end. You're still going to be part of this family. People need that. If you want a nine to five job, it's not a good line of work to go into. 